briefly about that as well. Awesome. All right, so with this discussion, I want to go into some of the science briefly, uh, just, just a few slides, I promise. But greenhouse effect is probably the most fundamental thing to understand about climate uh, science. And how many people know, can explain what the greenhouse effect is, what it does to the atmosphere? Great, great. So in a nutshell, in a nutshell, solar radiation passes through the atmosphere and there are many frequencies involved, but the one we're considering is short wave infrared radiation, which is, which is associated with heat. But when it hits the earth and it hits the surface of the earth, the surface re-emits it back as long wave infrared radiation. And most of that radiated heat is absorbed by greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, uh, methane, and it's radiated back towards the surface. Now, I want to remind you that if we didn't have the greenhouse effect, the temperature of the Earth would be about negative 18 degrees Celsius, so it's, it's needed for us to exist. The problem is it's, it's more greenhouse gas emissions causing war, uh, life or causing temperatures to be warmer for life to exist. Now, here's a graph showing the atmospheric CO2 concentration, and this is measured by Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, and it's pretty horizontally and vertically it's distributed pretty equally. So it's measured in one place and that's where we get the data from. And it's more than 400 parts per million. In fact, it fluctuates, but the highest I think was about 417 ppm. And proxy data sources suggest that in the past 800,000 years, this is the highest concentration greenhouse gases have ever been, especially CO2. And it's this is, never, this is an experiment for humanity because modern human civilization has never existed in this kind of concentration before. So we're literally creating history as well as playing with our you know, livelihoods. And of course, the big thing is temperature anomaly. So absolute temperatures are not measured and they're not like, they're measured but they're not graphed because I mean, where, from where, where I'm standing and where you're sitting, temperature variation is huge. So they measure the anomaly, and that is the difference of the temperatures between a certain average and the year. So for example, here, the zero degrees Celsius line, the horizontal line, is our reference. And that is the average for the 1961 to 1990, almost a 30 year period, which is a climatology data set. And with respect to that zero degrees Celsius line, we see the differences. So in 1850, it was about 0.4 degrees lower than that. In 20, 2016 and 17, it's almost about 0.7 to 0.8 degrees higher than that, indicating the warming trend. Now, what many climate scientists have an issue with, not many, actually, a really few ones, um, is the sensitivity of this temperature to the greenhouse gases. The question is, how much of the CO2 concentration is really affecting temperature? And that's, that's a valid question. But to realize that the Earth is warming, I mean, it's, it's not a debate anymore. It's, it's a fact. And the question, do you believe in climate change, is also kind of misleading. So here are some scenarios from models. And many of these models don't always agree with the observations. But here's what is used by IPCC, which is the most uh, well-established scientific organization on climate change. If there are no climate policies, our temperatures might increase from 4.1 to 4.8 degrees Celsius. The best case scenario in which we start right now, we could reach a warming of just about 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2100. But even in that case, the warming is there. It's not, it's not that climate change is not going to happen or warming is not going to happen. It's just minimizing the damage. So this is a map of CO2 emissions per capita. Now, what is the most emitting country in the world, like carbon emissions nationally? Which country ranks the highest? Do you, anyone knows the answer? I'm hearing India, I'm hearing Saudi. Not, don't look at this map, this map is misleading. N national CO2 emissions, just, just the total CO2 emissions per country, which is the highest? China, there you go, exactly. Now per capita means per person, right? So CO2 emissions, if you divide it by the entire population, you see, China is lower. Chinese people, like people in China, there's an inequality in lifestyle, but on average, emit lower emissions per person compared to other countries like the United States, Saudi Arabia, Australia. And 
this map indicates the higher consumption lifestyle in different countries. So that's why I chose this because you can see US, Canada, Australia, Saudi, um, Qatar, th these countries have a very wealthy life, uh, lifestyle and it's dependent on fossil fuel use, which leads to the conclusion that CO2 emissions per capita are really high. And when we discuss climate change, it's always a binary, temperature increasing or not increasing, but we, in most discussions, especially scientific ones, we tend to ignore all the other problems. So how many people have heard of this concept of planetary boundaries? Oh, awesome, awesome, great. So this was an, a research effort by Johan Rockström at the Stockholm Resilience Center. And basically he and his team discovered that we have nine planetary boundaries, climate change is just one of them. So we can look at phosphorus pollution, nitrogen pollution, land system use change, um, biospheric integrity means biodiversity, uh, atmospheric aerosol loading, novel entities, that means chemical pollution, pesticides, etc. So, and ocean acidification. So this research was mapping, okay, how, f how much do we have uh, which is below a tipping point? And the tipping point is basically, if I tip this bottle this way, it'll come right back. But if I tip it more, gravity will pull it down. So tipping points are these points at which the system stability shifts. It can't come back to its original position. And we can see that biodiversity, phosphorus, nitrogen, that's already exceeded tipping points as estimated by this group. And all of these are related to climate change, but there are their own issues as well. Even if climate change didn't exist, even if temperature wasn't warming, we still have phosphorus pollution, nitrogen pollution, fresh wa freshwater use, and biodiversity loss. So again, this is a short video, which I'll sh I might show later, but we're kind of running out of time. But Species diversity in 58% of ecosystems is critically low. We're under, by most ecologists' point of view, we're under a sixth mass extinction. And like Joy mentioned, we, we are losing insects, which is a cannery in the coal mine. I mean, insect loss, they're the base of the food chain. If we lose insects, we'll do the pollination. In fact, there's, I, I didn't include the picture here, but there's a, a region in China and they don't have bees because of excessive use of bee pesticides. So the farmers grow crabapple trees and they hand pollinate the trees with, with ear, earbuds. Can you imagine that? Hand pollination? I mean, these beings are, we need them. We can't survive without them. So the problems, problem politics has is this issue of ecology versus economics. Ecology is treated as a subsystem of the economy. The economic system only wants resources from the ecosystem and takes, like, prices it. It doesn't value it inherently. And the other picture over here is showing an eco econo economy as a subsystem of the ecology. And this is how many cultures in the past have existed. They, they respected the environment. They had a spiritual value. They had an inherent meaning. And now we just based things on prices. So negative externalities. Um, this is the main issue which we're going to deal with today. Uh, carbon dioxide is, a, I mean, climate change can be seen as a market failure because it's not priced, it's, it's externalized. So exter who knows the meaning of externalities or heard of this term before? So exactly, yeah. So um, the global commons, air and water, and land are not valued by the economic system inherently, right? And companies keep polluting until they're forced to pay a fine or until they're regulated by the government. So there's no inherent incentive for companies to take care of the environment. And that's, that's leading to this issue of negative externalities. So if, if this glass bottle is produced by a certain firm and I pay for the price of this, let's say it's $4, um, but I, am I paying for the ecological damage caused by silicon mining or the emissions released by this industry? Most likely not. And that's, that's counted as negative externalities because it's affecting the global commons and not, probably not the local. So here's a picture. Does anyone know where this was taken? Texas. The, these are the shale fields in Texas. And you can see how it's damaged the landscape. I mean, this is oil wells and yeah, mining and drilling, everything. So this is a landscape 
from where about 20% of the fossil fuels in the country come from. And coal mining, so this is the Appalachian region. And in fact, I had a sociology class and I, we saw a documentary on uh, this exact topic. And there are communities there that, which suffer from black lung disease, kids suffering from cancers, all because of coal dust, coal mining, and, and people living there are arguing for jobs. So that's the controversy, ecology versus economy. So this, I titled this slide, The Green Growth Dream. And <laughs> the reason is what environmentalists want and is, is an increase in the GDP, increase in the growth, economic growth. But at the same time, they want a decrease in the carbon dioxide emissions. So you can see past 2010, over here in the zoomed in picture, the GDP is increasing, but the CO2 emissions are decreasing. How did that happen? This is just for the US. How did that happen? And why did that happen? That's one, one reason. Natural gas, that's the major reason, exactly. Natural gas is less emit, emitting less carbon dioxide, but it has another issue. What is, what is the main issue associated with natural gas? Fracking, fracking. How many of you have seen this documentary called Gasland by Josh Fox? Yeah, okay, awesome. And in that documentary, like, there are communities which, where there's fracking and they, they light a, a fire on the, when they switch on the tap and the tap is emitting methane, so it lights up. And I mean, it's, it's, there's, there are other researchers showing it doesn't have any effect, but fracking uh, has millions of tons of chemicals and water injected into the ground to extract this. So, I mean, saying that it doesn't affect anything is false. Now, I want to shift us, uh, the conversation to our dependence on fossil fuels. So you can see over here, I was surprised to see this, but the United States on average consumes about 20 million barrels of oil per day, almost 20 million. And per year, that translates to 7.3 billion barrels of petroleum products. So we, we are embedded in fossil fuels. I mean, the clothes we're wearing, how we came here, the, this infrastructure, it's all because of fossil fuels and national subsidies to the, these kind of uh, oil, gas, and coal amount to about 20.5 billion per year. 20.5 billion. So it's, it's increasing, like it's a part of the economy and it's, it's also what led to civilization here. So here's a uh, image from a, a book called Petrosubjectivity. It's a really interesting image. And can you see it clearly? Like, I guess just the subtitles. So we have food, energy, transportation, work, health, shelter, clothing. All of the things we do every day relies on fossil fuels, from food to whatever you name. In fact, I was having a conversation with one of my mentors, and if we decided to live a fossil fuel-free life right now, what, is, what would we have to do? Sorry? That, that's one step. But like, imagine right now you decided, okay, I'm gonna just live fossil fuel free. Like, I'm, I'm gonna live a life which doesn't need fossil fuels. What would the ultimate conclusion be? Sorry? There, there is one way. <laughs> one conclusion we came to. Living naked or in a forest with natural clothing by killing a deer or plants. Like, that's, that's the only way to go fossil fuel free. But where are you going to get the weaponry? That's right. You can make it out of stones or you could make it out of wood, but... A steel axe. Yes. That's different. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's counted over here, right. Exactly. Like foraging, gardening, everything, the, the manufacturing, the tools we use needs fossil fuels.